We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear. Video casts like this. Podcasts like this. Crowdcast events with famous authors. Live quizzes. And we can guarantee to make your next birthday one you'll never forget. There's only one way to guarantee getting all of this, to getting it before anybody else, and that's to sign on to be a supporter on Patreon. Full details at this address. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. Friend of the pod, Bob Younger. Bob, nice Hi, to hello, you. hello. Terrific. We haven't Tell had it. you on since you were on with the with the Bob Dylan podcast a few years oh, ago. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's that's when we that's when we last did something. That's right, right. you were sensational. So Probably tell us, t- tell us where you are now and uh, what you've been doing in the last um, in the, during this bloody war. Okay, uh, what have I been doing? So I've been in Stockport mainly, but I've been bobbing back and forth to London because all my post is here and my admin's here and my printer's here. Um, and I've been looking after my mum, who's in the next room. Um, and she's, um, it, it's been quite interesting actually, because we went, I went up to Stockport to stay with her for lockdown uh, to the house that I left when I was 18 years old, oh. going, I'm never coming back here. And I've now been there for the longest time I've ever been there since I left when I was 18. So I went to Leeds University when I was 18 and I never looked back. And, um, and so, yes, yeah, so I've been back in Stockport. So what's been interesting is I'm with my mom, whose memories are floating yeah. now, in and out. And whilst I'm remembering being in Stockport, oh, yeah, I remember that bus stop. Yeah. Oh, my God, I know. Her. Oh, God, we snopped there. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, God, we, that's gone. What's there? Oh, that, you know. And, and actually finding that Stockport is really rather beautiful. And I, I never would have said that. Which you never appreciated at the time. No. Never appreciated. And now I go, what a beautiful town centre that is. How gorgeous and, and, and how architecturally interesting. Um, it's, a, it's a really lovely town. And the people, I say to Dave, the people are, often, the people are hilarious and wonderful. You know, somebody said, well, your shrubs are nicer than ours. Your garden's <laughs> nicer than ours now. You've improved the whole tumbler of the road with that. <laughs> Them shrubs have brought, they've brought the bar up. Because I put shrubs in my mum's garden. I did the patio and somebody came around and said, oh, that's lovely, that patio. That's lovely. <laughs> Nobody would use the word shrub in London. <laughs> no, that's very northern, isn't it? It is. <laughs> I don't know why it is. Has your mother, I have to ask, has your mother kept your bedroom as it was when you were 18 years old? Because that's very often the case. No. No. Uh, no, but I used to write poetry on the inside of a cupboard. And my sister, of course, took over my room as soon All as right. I left. And she put her poetry in. So when I was clearing it out the other day, I looked under there and I thought, oh, my God, there's my philosophical. You know, when you're 14 and you think the world's against you. So you start reading people like Jenny, that, yeah. uh, and, and you write it all down on a wall because you think in case they can't find me, it'll be on the wall. That'd be great. And, and it's fine. <laughs> and it's my sister's. And, it's, and my sister was very interested in Japan. So a load of Japanese stuff. So yeah, so it's been a good, it's been really. All right. And your ma is your ma's German, and your dad was Czechoslovakian, is that Czech, right? Yeah. See, that's yeah. very to me, that's very exotic. So interesting music in the house where you were growing up. And, uh, uh, music, I mean, just music all the time, and um, I mean, they they were bone poor because my dad was a refugee, so they were bone poor. Um, but but they used to take me to. I mean, I was tiny. They took me to the cinema. They took me to. We were in the. We were sort of taken in by, whether we were or not, we were taken in by the Catholic community in Rochdale, which is where I, which is where I was right. born and grew up. I mean, my my first seven years were Rochdale. Gracie, and, uh, Gracie Fields territory, isn't it? People right. used to say, oh, she's a proper Gracie Fields. Isn't she like Gracie Fields? <laughs> she's just like Gracie Fields. Do you have a, sh- do you have a shawl? <laughs> and, well, I'm thinking of getting one now. You know, now I'm moving south. I'm thinking it's time to do that. And a pair of clogs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Play up my northern roots. Be a professional northerner. Yeah. Uh, right. Why not? Why yeah. not? It's, it's served a lot of other people very well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's no many name. people made a, made, yeah. made a living out of that. So can you remember what means of playing music there was in your house when you were a child? Do you have a oh, record yeah. player and things we like that? We had a record player. With one of those record players, you do that. That one. 
We had one of those. We had records by Mario Lanza, Maria oh, Callas, lovely, lovely. Nat King Cole. Oh, brilliant, yes. Nat King Cole. Um, we had the, we went to see South Pacific at the cinema. And so we bought the gatefold sleeve of oh, the soundtrack lovely. to South Pacific with all the pictures. Gonna wash that, that man right designer. out of my hair. Yeah, yes. all of that. Happy and the whole thing, I loved it so much. I still think it's one of the great musicals. It's it just, is, it is. Um, yeah. We had the radio was on all the time. So right at the beginning of that kind of point where the 50s become the 60s. I mean, I remember putting on Radio 1, but as me and Mary Wilson do do a memory lane on all this stuff. It's, it's quite depressing being in a car with us. Anyone would think we were the age we were. Um, but we both remember putting on the radio and listening to Woke Up One Morning, Half Asleep with All My Blankets yeah, 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 in a Heat yeah. when Radio 1 started. I can Nin still say that. I can yeah. remember that. I can remember that. It was the first Radio Luxembourg, played, wasn't it? you know, Radio Luxembourg under the covers. Yeah, yeah. Soul music, because I was in the Northwest, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I mean, it was great. It was absolutely great. So loads of music in the house, loads of music around, you know, the, the, the little church um, youth club. The guy used to send to Detroit and get his records and send to, and he got records from Stax and records from Tamla oh, really? that weren't out yet. And he used to come in with this pile of discs and he used to stand on, you know, a church hall top. And, and the boys, and we all had these blue skirts and, and we all did the, the dance, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Can and you remember the first record you ever bought? The first record I ever bought, this is so embarrassing that I can't Good. bear to tell you. Lovely. No, you're going to tell us. You're going to tell us. If you're going to San <laughs> That's a great record. Be sure to wear some flowers in the your flowers hand. In I thought, why am I not in San Francisco? Yeah, as why opposed to, were Stockport? you in Stockport? Yes, <laughs> why am I in Stockport? We bought caftans. <laughs> yeah. well, nobody over there is writing songs about through. Stockport. Yeah. Walk through Mersey Square with caftans on. <laughs> it's extraordinary. I was thinking this recently when I was writing something about this. How fast the idea of San Francisco spread around the world. Yeah. You know, so the kids in, I was in Wakefield, you're in Stockport. Yep. And, and we knew all about this thing, this we place. Knew, we knew, knew about, about Ashbury and yep. we knew about caftans and strange glasses and, and putting flowers in your hair. And people did their own kind of, Rather pathetic version. Versions of San Francisco, they did. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. You could get a flower and you could put it in behind your ear or something you like that. You could get a caftan. Oh, but when you consider that, it only just yeah. started happening in San Francisco. It's a long way away. Yeah. Nothing yeah. else had ever spread quite that quickly before. No, you know? I know. I know. We went to see um, we went to the film of Woodstock the day that Jimi Hendrix died in our Afghan coats, you know, with our, in Manchester. We went, we went by bus to Manchester, 92 bus, and we got off with our Afghan coats and all our jewellery and all our beads and our hair. My hair had a park, parting here, and then it just came down like two curtains yeah, yeah, down yeah, there yeah. and sort of swayed about. And I had these big, long earrings and a huge, horrible fur coat that my mother refused to be seen out with me wearing. And we went to see it. And then at the end, when Jimi Hendrix came on, um, on, on the film, everybody in the cinema stood up. <laughs> everybody stood up. I mean, like lemmings, you know, like, like, well, oh, God, he's died. Stand up, you know. Yeah, oh, I suppose, yeah. If he, for Jimmy, for Jimmy. Well, of course, because he, he died, that's right, of course. It's 1970, yeah, it was just by absolutely, the yeah. that the film came out. Because he yeah, died, yeah, yeah. and so we all stood up, and, and I had a friend who met him on Bramall Station, um, and he was walking down Bramall Station with his coat flying you know and his hair and and carrying his guitar case and my friend was in the drama group and was probably gay but you didn't know that then do you know what it i mean wasn't invented then wasn't, wasn't invented, invented then no. although my father had a friend who was homosexual <laughs> oh, right. that was invented that was invented but being gay wasn't <laughs> being gay wasn't we had a local but, butcher who was homosexual because you knew you are, you see. he was always getting up in court in, in the local paper but everybody just sort of they, yeah. They did. yeah, it's fine. Okay. Everybody Homosexuals just... weren't camp, but gay people were. Camp. <laughs> That's the difference. Yeah. I didn't, uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't anyway, discover either. camp until I came to London, 68, 69. Yeah. And then you realise that all the jokes on Round the Horn, yeah. they're all been based on this thing that went it, on in Chelsea or yeah. wherever. You know what I mean? Harder the handbag. <laughs> <laughs> Harder the handbag. Harder the, the handbag. 
Boner. <laughs> Boner. Boner. <laughs> And Julian and Sandy used to. Sorry, I'm going to interpose this because it's, yeah, too, good, it's too good a joke to let to let go. You know, Julian and Sandy on one round the horn every week. They were a different. They were a different company. They were a hairdresser or they're a travel agent or whatever. <laughs> you know, we're a travel agent. We call Santa. And it also be a joke involving Bona. And they said this week we're solicitors. We call Bona Law, which of course <laughs> is you know, less well known British politician of the 19th century. Oh, but I love that joke. We're called Bona Law. Sorry about that. Anyway. Oh, no, no, you're, that's a, that is so that's good. brilliant. So, that is good. Bob, have you, got any, have you got any souvenirs to show and tell, to share with us? Anything yes. You Go on, what have you got? Well, I'm going to oh. start with an invisible thing, because oh, right. while we're in Stockport and Manchester and still up north, right. um, here you have to imagine I'm holding, holding a drumstick. It's right. Keith Moon's drumstick. Oh, right. oh, good work. It's Keith Moon's drumstick, which disappeared from my bedroom when my bedroom became my sister's bedroom oh, and God. never was to be found again. And it was Keith Moon's. He'd actually held it and sweated on it and yeah. played it at the gig we saw where the Who were doing everything. They were just, you know, and Roger Daltrey was doing that twirling his mic oh it was brilliant it was a where, brilliant where, gig and we where was that where did, you, where did you see where did you see them it was in manchester and it's a place that doesn't exist anymore and it was down a side street and i remember us going around the loading bay and um and we said hello and keith Moon gave us his drums uh, very oh funny. what sort of year was that I mean, this is can you I remember when know. it was i, I would have been yeah. about 16 17 i suppose fantastic that's fantastic uh, yeah. we we had great we had great gigs up there I mean, everything, Mark Boland, Tyrannosaurus Rex, you know, the, the university had great gigs. Oh, well, this is it. Well, it's before the, it's before the proper gig circuit, isn't it, really? Yeah. Universities were the place, 68, 69, 70. That was where, well, the Who did live at the Leeds, at Leeds University. At Leeds University, which is... Of course, you know, you, you went to Leeds University. And so because probably, of that. You sat, you sat on the parquet floor in the refectory, which was where they did that album which is the exactly. least promising looking and venue. amazingly people did sit to listen to that show yeah, yeah, they actually yeah. sat which is yeah. astonishing really music yeah. of that yeah. intensity and excitement but so yeah you, you had a keith moon drumstick but your sister somehow chucked it out or lit oh, the fire mother. with I'm it not, i'm not saying it was our christina i'm just saying i had it yeah, yeah i'm yeah. showing it you have yeah. to see it there no, i can see it drumstick. yeah yeah I can imagine. now it's gone Oh, well, what a shame. What and a what shame. would that be worth now? Well, I don't know. You probably have to prove very the provenance prove of it. That, you know. Yeah, very hard DNA. to prove the Keith Moon DNA. DNA. <laughs> oh, that's, have you not that's watched good. any television? That's DNA. good. I like that. Yeah, that <laughs> works. I do think there ought to be a rock and roll antiques road show that probably ha yes. has a DNA test at the end. You know? That's a genius that's idea. That's a great that's idea. Get, that's get got entirely rock and roll artifacts. That's fantastic. That's I'm always amazed, I'm always amazed that they haven't done it. They do occasionally have rock and do roll they? things on there, don't they? Yeah, very occasionally. And it's a big deal. You know, people love it. Because yeah, everyone's people interested. People love it. The thing that yeah. always gets me about Antiques Roadshow, which I can't resist watching, if I walk in the room and it's on, I will stay. Because I want to see the look on their face when they're told that this thing that their great-great-grandfather brought back from China and has been carefully passed on from generation to generation has survived the blitz God knows what is actually worth, you'll be surprised about this, £125. Yeah. So, that's right. So it's £125. <laughs> And they have to put on that. Oh, that's oh, marvelous! You can see their crestfallen. I know because they wanted five thousand six hundred and seventy-five. And they were going to flog it, and they were going to go on a cruise. But yeah. now they can't. <laughs> yeah, but nothing. Now it's they're back to Butlins. Yeah, it's it just never works at all. It so, what have, you, have, what have you got there that you can actually show us? Right, so I can do one of two things. I can take it off the wall or I can take you to the wall. Oh, take us to the wall. Well, you go, yeah. uh, fine, as long as we don't lose go. the yeah. light because we've got very good light on you. I oh, know, right, okay. Going to the wall. Here we go. Right, okay. Okay, okay. We're going to the wall. We're going to the wall. We're going, going into the east we're wing, Mark. a lovely little tour of the flat, too. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Danny okay. the Wonder Dog. Danny the one oh is that, was, that is, is that, Danny the Wonder Dog? Is that Julian Clary? Oh, yeah, yeah. that's Danny the Wonder Dog, and that is one from the original series of Sticky Moments. Wow. 
So remind Original series of sticky moments, and then I, I've got the picture that I'm going to show you. Oh, right. So art show. Was that, was that a, go on, remind me. Um, because I recognise the Wonder Dog, and obviously I associate that with Julian Cleary. Yep. So the sticky moments, was yep. that a TV thing? Yep, it was TV, and we did it. I mean, it was extraordinary, because what, what we realised, Julian and I were going over it the other week, or I say the other week, about two years ago, and um, I'm not very good with time, and we were, we were archiving all the music on it, because we'd written a lot of the songs, and we had all these really great arrangements of daft covers, um, that Michael and I and, and Russell, well, Michael and I mainly had done. And, uh, and so we were all coming and, and Julian said, look how thin we were. I said, look how stoned we were. <laughs> I mean, we were absolutely, we were all beaming all the time. I had no idea what was going on. And Julian said, you, you know, they'd never have allowed us to make that now because now everything's got to go through the legal department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't say anything. You can't do anything. And everything was completely impromptu. So we'd, go, we'd turn up for the rehearsal on the day and the company would say, oh, that song's two, and, um, two minutes 70. Um, could you get it to two minutes 20? And Julian said to me ages before that, just say yes to everything and don't do it. Yes. So, so are you writing a good you policy write a song for each show? <laughs> yeah, we, did, we either yeah. arranged it or we wrote it, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so we said, yeah. And then we do it exactly the way we'd done it. And they'd go, let's see how much better that is. When yeah. <laughs> so like, like, they didn't have a clock or anything. You know what I mean? It was, it was all very loose. And it was great an fun. analog in those days. Yeah. Yeah. And it was fun, actually, is what it was. it was. It was fun to do. And we had these ridiculous costumes that were made of bits of Velcro that if you breathe too hard, the bro Velcro burst open yeah, yeah, yeah. and you'd be a Kimbo on television. Um, and it was just, um, um, it was, it was, it was a fabulous time. So uh, how, how, did, how did you meet Julian? How did um, that all happen? Oh gosh. So that was at the Bushfires Cabaret, which Abby Grant, who writes now, who, who's now sort of quite well-known writer and um, comedy writer, Abby Grant was running the Bushfires Cabaret. And it was a really big cabaret in Shepherd's Bush. And everybody wanted to play there. And Michael and I got on the bill, so we were really excited about it. And um, we turned up for the sound check. And of course, everybody else had gone by the sound check because comedians either didn't sound check, didn't care, or if they did, they just didn't, they didn't, yeah, they didn't bother. So we go turn up for the sound check and then sat in the audience to watch everybody um, because I think there weren't any wings. And Julian came on just before us and I had a bandana on and he came up and did a thing about what's wrong with your head, you know, big laugh, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, we went on to do our thing and afterwards he came up and he said, I'm so sorry. I would never have said that to you if I'd known you were a performer. I never would have said to you. I didn't realise and how marvellous would you come to tea? And so we went to tea at his house, well, his, his flat, which was in Seymour Place, Seymour Building, Seymour Place. And, uh, and he said, I've got a vision of a show with music. And that was about 1985. Right. And um, we've Fantastic. been friends ever since, yeah. Oh, very good. Very That's good. brilliant. So yeah. what were you, yeah, right, so you, you, were, you were already performing in your own right. Oh, God, yeah. Was, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, no, I'd, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd had a record deal with three CBS courgettes. at that point. Sure. I'd done three courgettes. Three courgettes. That there was on tour. I don't know if you can see. That's Julian. Oh, that's, right. that's Phil Herbert, Hugh Jelly. That's Russell Cherney, sadly now gone. That's Michael Parker, sadly now gone. Um, and me. And we, we were having such a fun tour that we said, this is outside the Dome in Brighton. So we said, let's, have, let's take a photo of ourselves because this is a moment where we've had such fun for this whole tour. Let's just take a photo of this and we'll all put our sunglasses on. You know, it's so stupid. You know, we all, oh, great, let's do that. So that's us. And I yeah, had that photo, but nobody else had it. But actually, I was yeah, able like to a give scar it to, group. I, I was able to give it to every single person done in these lovely frames from Snappy Snaps. Oh, very good. <laughs> do you great. find do you find when you look back the pre mobile phone you haven't got that many photographs? Because no, I've got acting it, oh, have you? Yes. So you were you were a person who always had a camera with you, did you? Or uh, Yes. And you had, okay. Yeah, or we had a camera. Yes, or somebody did, or somebody did. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, yeah, because that... I went all over Africa. That's coming up. Oh, right, go on. Take us to Africa. Let's have the, let's have the African tour. 
Okay, here we go. Well, Younger and Parker, for some reason, and it was a complete fluke, Younger and Parker were offered a trip to Sudan by the British Council to play at the International Jazz Festival in Sudan, <laughs> in Khartoum, right? You can't oh. make it up, obviously. And so this is not actually from there. This is the snake is from Malawi. Can you see it? The snake. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, 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 he's from Malawi. We'll get to him. Right. We'll get to him. But from <laughs> from um, Sudan, we've got a Darfur dancing skirt there. All oh, right. Wow. That's a Darfur dancing skirt. So what happened? We went out on this plane via, I think, Paris, and the, the plane stopped in the night in. Egypt. Right, yeah. And we yeah. saw the Sphinx and we landed and nearly everybody got off the plane and there was left on the plane maybe six people, two of whom were me and Michael and the rest were the French group who were going to be doing their part of the International Jazz Festival, which was, by the way, three sets of things. It was a flautist from Switzerland who nobody ever saw because he got <coughs> the first day, didn't perform, didn't do anything. The French jazz group, who were about as jazz as that coffee cup, right. and me and Michael, doing our songs about washing your clothes in a laundrette and falling in love with somebody else. You know what I mean? You, you, and, um, and we went to Hartoum, and the first thing that happened was we got off the plane, and I thought, gosh, there's a hairdryer on, and it was actually the temperature. It's the temperature, <laughs> yeah. Temperature. And we came off the plane. They had to carry the French people off. We came off the plane, and we went into the customs place, and they opened everything. They opened, you know, um, percussion eggs? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they opened everything. Everything was strewn out all over the floor, everything. And somebody came in and, and did some bribery, and we got through. And then we all got into a jeep. Did some and bribery. That's so good. Well. <laughs> we had special passes because there was a curfew because it was, you know, always on the edge of civil war at that time. Yeah, this yeah. Just after the Gulf War, this would have been, nine, I guess this was 92. Yeah, call it 92. And um, so we, we get to this kind of gateway where there were boys with guns that were thicker than their thighs. I mean, they were so thin. And they were boys, and they put their guns through the window of the Jeep to see oh, the good papers. God. And we were one paper short. We had to go back. Some more bribery had to happen. Then we came back again. And uh, that was my introduction to Sudan. Um, and we had the most extraordinary time. We drove across the desert. We, were, we didn't know till the day before that we'd be able to go to a place called El Ubaid. And it's right out. It was right on the edge of where the Darfur problems were happening. So they said we might not get the paperwork. But in fact, we did get the paperwork and we went. And um, I got taken to a football match. Um, and we were, I was there. Me and the woman who was with us from the British Council were the only women in the entire football ground. And everybody sat on the floor, except there were three plastic chairs for us. So we sort of <laughs> sat on these plastic chairs and somebody brought us tea. Um, and we watched a football match. Uh, and we did a, a gig in a sort of place surrounded by camels where all the electrics were, were bound together with bits of old sellotape. Um, yeah. It was amazing. It was God bless amazing. the British we've had, Council. We've had the fabulous tour of Sudan. Very exciting. It and was then with guns, bribery. That's fantastic. Well, well, because of that, they invited me to go to Cameroon because they said, look, some people can't hack this stuff because it's, it's you know, because it's not five-star hotel, you know. No, no. It, it, can be, it can be a bit edgy, sketchy, we'd say now. Edgy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, and I, I was just, I mean, I, when are you ever going to go to any of those places? We went to Cameroon and then we went back to Cameroon to do a tour. And the premise of the tour was to do shows and workshops where there'd never been a performance. Because, of any kind. Well, because the notion of performance is inside, is inside ritual music or right. the church. Yeah, so yeah. 
So yeah. there wasn't such a thing then. I mean, this is going no. back, you know. Um, and, and it was because of that that I did my ethnomusicology masters because I thought, I don't know enough about this. I right. don't understand any of this. I don't want to understand it because I feel stupid. You know, I just felt like I didn't, I felt like I was missing things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so then I started to do that. Um, and, I, and I kind of built this whole relationship with Malawi, which is where the snake comes from. Oh. Right, right. Yeah, and I went to Malawi seven times. Oh, uh, really? I got to know the National Dance Troupe and the girls, well, the girls, the women from the National Dance Troupe took me out drinking one night. That was unforgettable. <laughs> That was unforgettable. We we went out. We went to a place called Devil's Road. I think you can understand everything. Yeah. From that. yeah. And and we all drank these little glasses. And I'm going, what is this? And you, you don't even look. Is the glass clean? You know. I mean, you can't you can't think about things like that. You just have to go. I'm drinking from this glass. That's fine. Yeah. And then we we're passing them around. You're thinking, okay, I'm passing that around. That's all fine. And. Uh, and, and they got so drunk that I had to take them all home. And, and one person I had to carry into her house and hand her over to her husband like that, you know. Um, bless their hearts. And we went dancing um, to this place and we were dancing. And of course, of course, and that's what's so interesting, I think, about now, about all of the things that we're asking about notions of race and colour. I think that's just an interesting time. But I was the only white person quite often in all mm. of these situations. Yeah, sure. And it was really interesting because you do see it an another way if you're the person that's the person that everybody can tell. Yeah. And also that everybody's making assumptions. So they're not they're, their assumptions are not you're going to steal my whatever. Their assumptions are or you're going to have a knife or whatever the assumptions now are. The assumptions were, you're really rich. Yeah, absolutely. You absolutely. can make change for us. You can help us. Yeah. And actually, yeah. you know, was neither really rich, but I did manage to make change. We got guitar strings sent by the MU out to musicians in Malawi, and I mentored some people, and I helped the people I could help. And, and you know, we did what we could do. Yeah. And I archived a lot of dances, and I archived a lot of music. Right. Very good. Very good. But, what, what, so back to the records. <laughs> Are there any, have you got any more any more gear you can show us? Gear? Oh yeah, yeah. we've got gear. Records, posters. I don't know. Oh, oh, that's a, oh, that's the three gorgeous. It's record. a I, picture disc. Oh, I remember that record. I've got a feeling that you could use the Z records, weren't you, for a while? It's a picture disc. And I played that on Radio One. I'm sure I did. Yeah, three courgettes. And you were a, a kind of disc. cabaret vocal group, weren't you? No, it was kind of gospel, actually. Uh, I mean, I you know, I've lived on the edge of contentious all my life because yeah. we, when we, when we used to go and busk, we used to sing, uh, oh, you know, the Nightingales, Golden Gate Quartet, yeah. um, uh, 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 Blind Boys of Alabama. Uh, yeah. We used to do all of that stuff, and and it was the best musical training you could have had it's it's the basis of everything it's got in it everything it's got all of syncopation all of jazz it's got everything in it you know we did it in three-part harmony at breakneck speed on the king's road down the embankment we bust beside pookie snackenberger and the people who became stomp you know it was a it was a remarkable time spirit of openness and all of that um so all of our stuff was right on that kind of weird edge between gospel and blues. If it was a Venn diagram, it would have all of those in it. Gospel yeah. and blues, and it would have a vocal harmony group, and it would have in it jazz. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. I remember so, you. Yeah. yeah. So what label was that, Mark? You were saying? Island. Well, I thought you were saying... Oh, it was that. Island. Didn't, didn't, you have a Chris, didn't you have a Christmas record out with Z, or am I imagining? Yes. Michael yeah, he Zilka. came to see us. He came to oh, see sorry. us. Michael Zilka came with the most glorious woman, who, of course, was Christina. Yeah. And turned up, <laughs> turned up at the ICA, um, and we were, we were all sat in the bar, and somebody said, it's Michael Zilka, it's Michael Zilka. You know, and we, were, uh, we were very cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what... Uh, 
and he came over and I love you guys I love you guys with his and he had a big fur coat on and it was silver fox I think it was right down to the floor I love you guys will you do a Christmas song for us and my my real crossness about this is it's not on the re-released version um so I put it every Christmas I stick it on YouTube again and flag it up because we wrote and it is I think one of my lyrical triumphs Christmas is coming <laughs> and, I don't uh, know this give, us, uh, give yeah. us a sample lyric um a Christmas is coming, no letter, no card. In the cold weather, my heart has grown hard. Now I love no one, into three parts. Oh, what can I do? Everybody in, Christmas is coming. Are you coming too? I mean, come on, Christmas nice. is coming. Are you coming That's too? Nice. That's Very gotta good. be, That's apart, from, apart from the connection to the Julian Entendre before we even did that <laughs> that has got to be worth it they should be oh, that out. That's so you, good. yeah you, so you, you you recirculate that on YouTube every every, every Christmas. Christmas every Christmas I hope that somebody will go god isn't this one of the greatest Christmas songs that nobody's ever known <laughs> and then that's it and that's my and that's, that's my house on sky and then you'll be that's raking my it boat. in that's and Greg my, Lake you know, that's right course, yeah. I often yeah. thought I often thought about doing a compilation called the second greatest Christmas records ever made because I I am um, you know every ones. year I I I, circ I circulate it's a big Country by David Sigerson, which it's is also on C, curiously. Yeah, it is. It is. Which yeah. is just a fantastic record. But it's obviously it's never going to be as well known as, oh, I certainly wouldn't dare. But it's basically the idea is it, it, America's a big country. And so here we are. Christmas is, uh, and we're wherever we are. And we're thinking about our cousins are out in Vermont and our sister is out in Alabama or whatever. It's a big country. Merry Christmas, everybody. And it's such a beautiful record. It's yeah. so lovely because they it. haven't met a lot of them, have they? They don't, no, they don't no, really no. know them. They bake bread and send it out west or whatever, don't they? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And I, I just <laughs> like the idea. Of, I like the idea of those Christmas records. They're never quite famous. Yes. So yeah. whenever you play them, you're playing them to somebody or at least a bunch of people who've never heard them before. Yep. And therefore they're delighted by it. Whereas... You know, Merry, Happy Merry Christmas, everybody. Everybody, everybody knows that, you know. So it's the second best Christmas records ever made. That's my, that's my dream compilation album. That works. Right, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put yours on it. Bob. Right. And then to, uh, call Ace this morning. That's a great idea. It, it probably is, actually. Ace it probably is. it. Uh, probably this year. This year of all years, actually. Because people are going to start thinking about Christmas next week probably aren't they because they they're not nothing else to think about nothing else to think about yeah they've got a long period of darkness and and that's the only bit of the end of it yeah. isn't it really they are so you, haven't been, you haven't been playing any shows then barbie you haven't, haven't been doing any socially existent shows or I have, have you Go i have on. i've done two i've done two uh, i did one at the 606 that it was the 606's first weekend open oh right the, the king's East road the old blues club. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So we did that. Well, it's Lotts Road now, but yeah, he's yeah. been in Lotts Road for yeah. 30 years. Um, but God bless Steve Ruby. And, you know, anybody watching this who hasn't been to the 606, go. Because he has kept the place going through this. He was the first person to open in London in the whole of the jazz circuit. Socially distanced, hand sanitizer, everything. And I can't tell you what a joy it was. I played with Jamie Sophia because they said, just keep the lineup small, please. And we couldn't do any rehearsing because, you, you know, we weren't supposed to rehearse. So we could only rehearse there. So Jamie and I went down and rehearsed at about four. And Jamie, it, because he hadn't been on a grand piano for seven months, he was like a person who, you know, because he's a rising star of British jazz. Everybody's going to know Jamie Sapir if they don't yet. He was playing like a demon. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. And sure enough, I mean, we both were just, it was just like whole sections of songs where we just looked at each other and went, just do it. Just go, right, go. Right. It was great. And the audience were like, oh. And people came up afterwards and said, thank God, thank God. We, we, we've no idea what we've missed. 
And I thought... So it's quite a small audience, were they all spread out and all that? Yeah. Every table had people on it, but they have to, they can only sell, like if one person's on a table, they can't sell the other three seats unless uh, the other people are there are in the bubble. So, uh, but there was somebody on every table, so it looked fine. That looked right. right. Yeah, yeah. And it was real. But people went mad. It was great. And but then... Did you, did you look really pleased? I mean, this is the thing I'm interested in because I was talking to a friend of mine who'd been to see Van Morrison, who played at the Electric Ballroom. And Van Morrison was the person saying, get this lockdown over, let's all go out. And I thought... So you think he's going to skip out on the stage, <laughs> punch in the air? Did Van look pleased to see you, the audience? Did he go, oh, this is great to be back? No, it was just the same miserable old scrote as usual. Whereas presumably your show, you must have, you must have been clear to the audience that you were thrilled yeah. to do it. We were, we were both on fire and they could tell and we could tell and they could tell, we could tell, they could tell, etc. Yeah. And then we did another one in the, uh, the old red line, which Dilly Keane phoned me up and she said, look, I've got an idea, don't laugh at me, but if I produced a show in our community pub, she said, because I can't see anything and that's the thing that's hurting me. Because she lost her whole tour, because Fascinating Aida had a 40, 50 day tour this year that went skyward, you know, yeah. in March. Um, and she said, we've got this community pub and they've got a place outside. And I thought I could put Marquis's roof up and I could get a stage and I could put up lights. And I, and I said, yes. And she says, well, I haven't told you. And I said, no, yes, we'll do it. Yes. W when do you want to do it? And she said, well, I don't know if you're free. And I said, well, I said I'm pretty sure I can guarantee we are. Every, we're all free. <laughs> Everybody is. Yeah. Bob, Dylan, Bob Dylan's free if he could. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so we went there and she, she said she could have sold it out two times over. It was sold out 75 people, but I mean, you could have got 150 in a normal day, but, yeah. but she could have sold it out twice. She had so many people phoning. And I mean, she just did it on her phone number on Facebook. Really? And it was in the middle of the Cotswolds and it was fascinating because it was an audience of people who I would say largely, not exclusively, but largely never in their lives would be inside a jazz club or no, a cabaret no, venue no. or possibly even a concert hall maybe, mm, mm. you know, um, and they just loved it. And, and, and I had Jamie playing again. Um, and I, I think it's always good to kind of let people in gently. So I said, you know, rising star of British jazz. You're not going to believe what he does with this, with this keyboard, because with keyboard, obviously, it was full size. But, um, and, th and they were cheering at the end of his solos, you know. Uh, and people coming up saying, I, why do I never listen to music like this? This is great. Yeah, yeah. So I thought this That's is a thrilling. very interesting time, yeah. actually, where maybe you're able to, I mean, you know, we've got to find the pluses in all of this situation because this situation sucks big time, yeah. which we all know. And for performers and anybody involved, which, which I am in theatre and music, the two things, the two things that are, are you know, limping along like wounded animals, um, you've got to find every bit of plus in it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think it's I think it's interesting that uh, you know when when you when I go back to a live event, I'm going to be really listening hard, you know, because you you'll appreciate not, it so much. You really will appreciate. Oh yeah. It. And um, no, it's interesting. I, I was talking to a, a friend of a friend of mine who runs Opera Holland Park. You know, yeah. They, 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 yeah. And they weren't able to do the normal major open air opera. He said, but they did, they did six shows or whatever, mm. just 200 people mm. and, you know, a relatively short recital and so forth. And he said, people were perfectly happy with it being shorter and so forth because the quality of listening was probably higher than it had been yeah. when it had, you know, because if you think here's a thing followed by another thing and then there's going to be another thing and then there's another, you, you, you're, um, you're not trying. That's true. Yeah. So, you, kind of, you, know, you kind of phase out for sections of it. Don't you, you switch yeah. off. You just you know, you're it. absolutely right. You're completely on it. Yeah. Whereas, everything, everything that we took for granted, we, we, we really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so have, you got any, have you got any more set up? Yes, yes. I've got three. I mean, you know, all things being what they are, none of us know what's around the corner, no, no, etc. Sure, sure. But I've got three in November and then stuff 
coming in in the new year. I mean, everybody's got stuff, but people I write, I write a lot with Mike Lindup these days. And, oh, um, right, I know Mike. And, and he, yeah, he's a beautiful, beautiful man, as you probably know. Um, and he's got his whole world tour went, um, and he's not working till they've got, I think they've got Japan in April. Is this level 42? Oh, oh, oh yes. Okay. But, yeah. yeah, and I mean that's and again it it may be it may not happen. It may yeah, not happen. Not happen. Um, yeah. People are saying all my all my friends who work in America who I work with in theatre and sort of across the across the genres. People like John McDaniel are going. The, oh, the Met last week announced. Well, this that, is it. They announced they're not doing yeah. anything this year. Not anything it, until no. uh, autumn twenty one. So, Bob. What if we were to ask you what is the greatest record ever made? Would you have a ready answer? I will have a ready answer. Now I had actually about seven of them. Oh I, right. I've decided to thin it down. Okay. Right, but I will tell you what the others are because it's because uh, right. I spent a lot of time thinking about this and I really enjoyed thinking about it. And I, and it made me think what is, what do we mean when we say the greatest record ever made? Whatever it's a you want. Really to do. tricky question. Meaning like and it, it's got to be a record that you keep on playing. No matter what happens, you keep on playing it. And it may be not the most whatever, but it's the one you go back to in that, in wherever it is. So the ones I go back to, in order of this one being... Is it, this is reverse yes. order, is it? No, this is the order first first. It's kind of... Oh, okay. Kind of blue mind. Kind of blue. Okay, right, right, fine. But because when do you, when you go, whenever somebody comes around and goes, I don't like jazz. I hate to tell you. Right. Sorry to tell you this, but I know you're a bit. But do you know what? And that's the one you play. Right. And you go, just okay. listen to this. And at the end of that, they go, is, that's not jazz, though, is it? And you go, no, no, that is jazz. And they go, <laughs> that's fantastic. And you go, right. right, that is the best jazz record ever. And of course, okay. you know, it's a kind of blue. It has to be kind of blue has to be kind of blue and i thought yeah which is a very what that's a perfect choice surely it's so a what choice. isn't that just a masterpiece those four solos and so what thank Incredible, you there's no there's there's no there's no but there's there's nothing there's nothing wrong with I, i've been th i've been through a major kind of change of mind about miles davis in the last year as i bored mark about on on many occasions because i i kind of emceed a performance at uh at uh, Cadogan Hall by the London Jazz Repertory Company, where they did a load of Miles Davis Gil Evans arrangements. And uh, and so it was obviously sketches of Spain and things like that. Which is fabulous. Which is fabulous. But it, the one that, that absolutely turned my head, and I now prefer it way above Kind of Blue, is Miles Ahead. I know I that I absolutely know. love that record, and I'd I never really heard it before, and now I can't stop playing it. I was literally playing it this morning before we started recording this. I've not well, been obsessed with the record so much in years. Well, I, I don't disagree with you, but I think for this little caption, it has to be something that opens a door and i think kind of blue opens a door okay fair enough no yeah. I, I would not, i'm not going to disagree you with know you, but, but and i don't disagree with you but i did have on my list because Go i on. think it's worth knowing what else was on this list. yes of course you know because inner visions was on this list all right okay stevie wonder yeah, yeah. Yep. and then i've got to say it and i know that people are going to go what what graceland Oh, no, well, fantastic record. Fantastic. Incredible record. record. Fantastic revolutionary. record. But is you know, it, is it as good? It. Is it as good? I'm obviously a great record. Is it as good as There Goes Rhyme in Simon? Yeah, you see, there you are. The minute you start doing that, all oh, Is it as good as Bookends? Yeah, exactly. What was Bleecker Street on? Oh, very early one. Yeah. Wednesday morning, 3 a.m. Wednesday morning, 3 a.m. You see, I loved that. That right. was a great album. Right. Bleecker Street's one of the great lyrics of all time. You remember I don't, really, I don't really know that. I've, got, I've probably got it here. Oh, but, fog uh, rolling in on, off the East River bank, like a shroud, it covers Bleecker Street. Feels oh, yes. Valleys it, where men meet, eyes the shepherd from the sheep. Voices leaking from a sad cafe. Smiling faces try to understand. I saw a shadow touch a shadow's hand on Bleecker Street. Uh, he's pretty good, Gorgeous. isn't he? He's he was pretty good. really good. I mean, no wonder he got pissed off that people didn't think he was as good as Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I, I think when the great, I often think when the great reckoning is happens, you know, when all of these 
all of this great generation of singers and writers all go off to meet their reward, as we say, you know. And when, and when, the, when the man finally looks at the record, all of it, Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell, all of you, Paul Simon, Paul Simon, I think, comes out very, very strong in that. In that I think so consistent, I do too. too. All the I way through. Too. I directed somebody doing a Paul Simon collection in America and he really worked hard at it and he went right into the, and every single one was a jewel, you know, yeah, there was like 20 songs and, and every single one was fabulous. And I thought, wow, now you see, I've got another one for you. Go on. Tapestry, Carol King. Oh, can't oh, go wrong. Yeah. Can't go wrong. What's wrong with Come that? Come on. Yeah, What's yeah, wrong yeah. with that record? As, you know, uh, as Lou Adler said, who produced that record, he said, Carol King has the voice that every woman likes to think she has. Oh, interesting. Which I thought was a really good point. He said, when, when, it, when people sing to themselves, the voice they hear in their head is Carol King. Yeah, yeah. because it's not too, it's, it's it's not not too not pronounced. Not, it's not too showy. It's yeah. kind of like anybody could sing like that if yeah. they could just sing she started, well. She started That's off right. doing demos, and he used to take round her demos because he worked for the publisher. And uh, they would always hang on to the demos by Carol King because they just they just liked they the way so she good. sang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas it didn't sound as a, she wasn't Dionne Warwick or whatever, you know. Yeah. She wasn't Jordan Belting or anything like that. It was she was demonstrating the song, and that's what appealed yeah. to people about the way she sang it. Yeah. And subsequently, that's what she did in Tapestry. Yeah, that's what and, she but, did in Tapestry, and I saw her tour that with James Taylor. So All right, oh, back then. Yeah. Yeah. 1971. Oh, you're good. 1971. Yeah. <laughs> Dead right. Oh, Trans Europe Express. All right. Oh, that's good. Tricky one, this. No, Tricky no, one, no. this. Because I, I thought, oh, I don't know, because, you know, fun, fun, fun on the autobahn. I sometimes think that's more fun. Right. But uh, Trans Europe Express. They were just fantastic. No, so original. Great. It's great so record. So original. So Very that's good. those are all those were my choices. Okay. And I thinned that down to kind of blue kind for of you. Blue. Well, listen, it's a it's a good list. It's a fair list, and uh, I'm sure that many people will, will see this or hear it and will rush off to uh, to agree with you and to uh, and to, and to play them and enjoy and them. to play Inner Visions again and to play <laughs> Tapestry again. Absolutely. Bob, it's been lovely talking to you. Brilliant to talk to you. Oh, joy. Really uh, what joy. And, um, and all the very best in your, your move. You're, you're moving to your first property. Uh, I'm, I'm, I feel like South a grown-up for the With first time. With the view time. of the sea, you were saying. Amazing. Yeah. That's so I've, brilliant. I've become an adult. <laughs> I'm weak with envy. <laughs> we will come and see you. <laughs> will you? Because I've got loads of room. <laughs> <laughs> Loads of room. Map and Lucia, welcome. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll be there. Stop. Oh, like... Version of Map and Lucia Thanks on so the much, back Bob. coast. Bye. Love to see you. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Love to see you too. Thank you. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.